for those of you who are lucky enough to see the film the whole way through, it's just an incredibly powerful film, in my opinion. Um, just from the, the perspective of how of what the Silk Road was, how it changed the economic landscape, uh, especially in a time where the government is just getting more and more involved in our lives, um, but also the implications that this has, and this trial has on the future in terms of privacy in the digital age. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much of your time talking, because we only have a short amount of time, and we have some really great people here that I really want you to hear from. So I'll go ahead and introduce you to them. Uh, first of all, there's Lynn Albrecht, and you would have seen her in the film. That's Russ Albrecht's mother. Um, she's one of the most courageous women I've ever met. And not only has she been fighting for her son's freedom, and her whole family's been fighting for that, but she really understands the implications of this case and the impact it could have on our future. And she's been fighting for that. So really, I mean, she's, she's been fighting for the rights of all of us. Um, we also have Tatiana Morose. Uh, she's an incredible singer-songwriter. She's uh, well well known in the Bitcoin community in particular. She's written songs about Silk Road, uh, about Bitcoin. Uh, she's also uh, the founder of uh, uh, the CEO of Crypto Media Hub, which is a PR a consulting and advertising agency for the blockchain industry. And she's the founder of Tatiana Coin, which is the uh, world's first cryptocurrency for artists. Uh, we have Doug Casey of Casey Research, the author of best-selling strategic investing, uh, crisis investing, and crisis investing for the rest of the 90s. Uh, he's, I mean, he's been on hundreds of, of television and radio stations. Uh, and he's a big advocate of less government in our lives, or perhaps no government in our lives. And of course we have George Gilder, um, a very well-known American economist. He, uh, in 1981, he wrote uh, the bestseller, international bestseller, Wealth and Poverty. Uh, and this actually made him President Reagan's most cited uh, living author, an incredible man. So we've got these great people to hear from, and if you could go ahead and Welcome, Lynn. Uh, Lynn, I mean, when when this film ended, it ended before the sentencing. I was actually at the sentencing. It was just an absolute perversion of justice, in my opinion. But please talk about what happened since uh, the end of the, the film, Deep Web. the movie about how there were corrupt agents who stole over a million dollars from the site. What it doesn't explain is that these two agents were, had high-level admin access to the site. They were computer experts and they had basically the keys to the kingdom. They could do anything they wanted on that site pretty much. They could, um, they had passwords, they could change PIN numbers, they could commandeer accounts and actually act as DPR and other aliases. They um, could change and manipulate, edit chats, posts on the forum and the marketplace. They had access to bank accounts, keys, and this evidence was used at trial, but they had access to change and had every motive to change to distract from what they were doing. Um, and our, even now, we don't know the full extent of this corruption. Um, our, our lawyers say we know the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of undisclosed information that the government apparently is not interested in revealing. Um, there were numerous encrypted emails by these agents. They remain encrypted. Um, just recently, Sean Bridges it came out that he had also stolen an additional $700,000. Um, our lawyers learned about this from the media, not from the government, who is obliged to disclose this kind of information. So there's, in my opinion, a whole, whole lot more to what happened that we do not know yet and may never know about what was tampered with and what happened on that side. And Lynn, it's true, uh, correct, that the lead investigators in this case are now in jail for fraud and corruption, correct? Right, for basically their massive corruption scheme. Uh, they are in prison serving seven and six years. However, Ross, who's nonviolent, peaceful libertarian, who had no priors and no charges of anything violent at all, was given double life without parole plus 40 years. Um, as Andy Greenberg, he asked, he said, has anyone ever been more harshly sentenced or punished for something they did with a computer? Um, his weapon, according to them, was a keyboard. Not an automatic weapon, not a bomb, 
on a knife, nothing violent, no victims came forward to say that Ross had harmed them in any way or were named. Um, I feel, and I hadn't said this before because I thought it might be hyperbolic to say that Ross is a political prisoner, but since then, um, the other sentencing of other people involved in Silk Road has come, made me come to believe it is. The biggest drug dealer on Silk Road, he was convicted of selling mountains of drugs, he got 10 years. The biggest cocaine and heroin seller on Silk Road got five years. A top admin during the height of Silk Road got 17 months time served. The agents got seven and six years respectively and just recently the guy who was running Silk Road 2 got eight years and Ross got double life without parole. So why the disparity, which is actually illegal. You, uh, the Sentencing Reform Act says that you cannot have this kind of disparity. It's out of proportion. But um, I, the, the judge cited the libertarian philosophy of the site. She cited posts on the site that she said were troubling and dangerous because they said the government was the enemy. And um, I believe they had to have an example. I believe that he is there for a platform, not for a product, not for drugs, but because he was never charged with actually selling drugs. Um, but for this platform that I believe is very threatening. Um, a, a, a platform that operates anonymously on the Tor network with cryptocurrency, I think the government thought was dangerous. And they needed an example, and uh, they got their example. So. Of course, the movie doesn't go that far, it ends with the trial, but um, the travesty of justice continues. And Tatiana, you visited Ross in prison. Can you tell us like, what that was like and your personal experience with this? The first time that I went to prison, I've actually gone more than once. Uh, I consider it to be one of the most traumatic experiences of my life, but at the same time, one of the, the best experiences because of the understanding that I gained from seeing um, the prison in real life. You know, we all watch our TV shows and we think that we know what jail is like. And not that it's necessarily so overtly violent. I would say that the guards were really mean and nasty for no reason. They were very abusive to visitors. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, I remember when I was leaving and, and I looked over at Ross and there was a glass divide between us because there was the glass and they marched them back to their little place. And I remember thinking about how barbaric is it that in this day and age, this is how we deal with the unwanted elements of our society. And that this has been going on for thousands of years. And it was deeply troubling and it's given me a lot of fuel to continue to try and raise awareness, not only for Ross, but to educate myself more about the dangers of our current criminal justice system and the prison industrial complex. On a more personal level, um, Ross hasn't really been um, in contact with too many people because you know there's an appeal and, and whatnot. You know he writes letters sometimes publicly, but in my personal experience, I would say that he's one of the most incredible people I've ever met. Um, he, I remember one time he had written me and he says, "I don't want you to worry about what's happening with your voice or what happened with me or with anything really, because as long as we're alive, there is reason to hope." And you know, look at how many times a day we're all complaining about what's going on. But this is a person that had such integrity and such commitment to this vision that even in the situation that he's in right now, he's still able to offer um, peace to others and, and a lesson to other people and to be an inspiration. And sometimes I'm driving and I'll see that there's, you know, oh, it's so nice outside, I wish that Ross could see this. But you know what, at the same time, I think that he has started a, he's kind of lit this fire where people who have become familiar with this story are now going to become much more engaged. And I think that obviously the outcome isn't ideal, but it's a start. And there are so many people in the prison and industrial complex that are in there for nonviolent crimes and there's nobody there to fight for them. There's nobody there to give a voice to um, these forgotten elements of society that we want to pretend are not there. And that's a, you know, that's, that's something where I think that we can all kind of help out with. There was a woman with, with children and she was saying that before her son 
uh, I'm sorry, before her husband went to prison, her children were getting straight A's, and now they're getting D's and F's. And it really reminds you of the ripple effect. It's not just the criminal that's punished, it's the entire family. And do you think that those children are gonna grow up and be productive members of society? Their chances of doing that have been diminished greatly. Um, and then that's going to continue through their children and they're going to, I mean, this is a ripple effect throughout our community and it's something that I think is, is, a, is a point that we can unite with people from both the left and the right um, and, and hopefully bring about some reform and, you know, Ross's situation can hopefully be reversed and, and for many other families as well. Uh, Doug, you're an outspoken uh, advocate against government intrusion in our lives. What was your response to the film or uh, the, the case in general? Well, I, I think it's just truly shocking and disgusting. And instead of people watching these ridiculous crime dramas that you see on television where the, just, where the judge is wise and the jury is judicious and the prosecutors are honorable, and the cops don't take bribes and aren't thieves, uh, and the FBI are all noble people that join it because they want to serve their fellow. This is a gigantic lie. Uh, the whole system is corrupt through and through, as far as I'm concerned, from the laws they operate under to these huge bureaucracies which have metastasized and become criminal uh, uh, conspiracies. I don't believe in conspiracies, really, but uh, it's turned into that. Uh, so um, I wish something could be done in the case of uh, Ross, or if not just Ross, but about a million other people in this country alone that are in the same situation. But I'm afraid that uh, there's not much that can be done until the uh, old rotten structure is brought down. And that brings us to another problem, because after a rotten structure is brought down, things don't get better, they get worse. Just like in 1789 in France, wonderful the rotten structure was brought down. Then it got worse with Robespierre, and worse with Napoleon. And in 1917 in Russia, the rotten structure was brought down. But then they got Lenin, and then they got Stalin. So I think the structure's gonna collapse here because the most malignant entity on the face of the earth at this time is the US government. This is perfect proof of it, although one of my many examples but it's gonna get worse after it comes down. That's just the way it works. So uh, that's not an uplifting message, I'm afraid, but I think it's the truth. George, you come from the economic side of things, but also the tech side of things. And they talked in the film about uh, decentralized markets now arriving, markets without a central figure that they can take down and then take down the entire site. How do you think that's gonna change the economic landscape or you know, what, what were your responses to the case? I think things are going to stand up. Is this, is this work? Yeah. yeah, I think things are going to get better. Um, can't, see can't see you. Oh, okay. Can't see you. Thank you. Friedrich Hayek said, the root and source of all monetary evil is the government monopoly and control of money and uh, the whole model of centralized control of money and capital gains uh, penalties for all people who use alternative monies is really the source of this problem to a great extent. And, uh, and I think that the Bitcoin blockchain and other innovations in distributed security can change this picture. And I think that uh, uh, the blockchain is a fundamental innovation in security because it changes the focus of security on concealment and centralization and firewalls and personal information concentrated in uh, particular places that invite attack to uh, security through publicity, through a public ledger that is distributed across all the computers on the internet ultimately, and uh, which uh, uh, 
make it impossible to hack it. Now these centralized systems are all breaking down. Uh, you know, the SWIFT network, which is the vital protection for the worldwide banking system, has been uh, hacked and $60 million extracted. I mean, there are lots of examples where the centralized system is collapsing. And uh, I believe that uh, the development of new currencies will provide new freedoms and, uh, and will end this identification of the manager of the conduit with uh, the commerce that happens to flow across it. And this is a, an important, uh, to all advances in information t technology, if you, if you create a new communication system and you're uh, liable for what all the communications in it, uh, you, the system ultimately collapses. So, so I think uh, uh, that the uh, Ulbricht case is an example of what happens with this conspiratorial world where everybody's drilling deeper and deeper and, and doubly and triply, and triply encrypting. And, and I, don't, I don't find all this very edifying, but, uh, but I do think that ultimately the promise of Bitcoin and the blockchain is more openness, more transparency, more uh, separation of conduit, from commerce, and I think this is uh, a crucial to a libertarian society. Thank you. I, I agree. By with the way, you. I, I will be signing books uh, at twelve forty over at the. I, I agree with George's optimism. I do think that technology is really going to lead to a lot more freedom in our personal lives going forward. But it's exciting to see what happens. Um, now. For those of you who don't know, Lynn actually uh, runs an organization. If you go to freeros.org, if you're interested in contributing uh, to the appeal process and all of that, I, I would really encourage you to. We probably have time for just like a couple of questions, maybe one or two if anyone has some. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and ask Lynn for just a closing statement. Does anyone have a, have a question? Yeah. Sure. Real quick. Um, right. Yeah, I watched the movie. I thought it was pretty even-handed, um, and I feel bad for Ross. It really looks like, uh, you know, perhaps his Fourth Amendment rights were trampled on and things like that, and the agents were corrupt along the way. Um, but one thing that did, well, I found very curious in the movie, they, they mentioned that there could be more than one DPR administrator, and I always thought that it was going to be established that Ross was one of the DPR, but they took the defense by saying, no, he was never any one of them at all. And even the wired reporter was convinced because, yeah, Ross was one of the DPR, but maybe not the one that ordered the hit. And uh, Ross had on his uh, computer the journal and uh, the big coins from Silk Road, and when he was captured, he was actually logged on to Silk Road. So, gosh, this is probably not a fair question, but I'm just really curious. I just I still want to ask you anyway, uh, Lynn, do you, do you believe that Ross was never any one at all of the DPR administrators? Well, I'd like to see a fair trial where everything came out. There's a lot that we don't know. Uh, I do believe that my son is an idealistic, well-meaning, libertarian, totally nonviolent. I don't believe the murder for hire smear, which, by the way, was never charged in court or proven, convicted, is true at all. I think it was used against him. Um, I really don't know, you know. Um, I have been told that it's inconceivable that he would be the one and only DPR. It's like having Jeff Bezos sitting in with a hoodie on in a cafe running Amazon. And I do know that, um, you know, there, I have a lot of questions. Um, I do know that I feel that if we don't have fair trials in this country, which Ross did not have and many people don't have, um, we are not a free country. And I'm very concerned about it. I, um, there's nothing like being up close and personal to something to really get it. And I am really alarmed about how we are losing our freedoms very rapidly. Um, I believe we're at a crossroads in history. You know, we've left the 20th century. We're careening into the digital age. 
And this case has many precedents that are, will determine how we live in the digital age. And you mentioned the Fourth Amendment, that's one of them, but not the only one. Most of the evidence was digital, very easily manipulated, faked, edited, changed, planted. And um, so it, it's an important case and it's an important appeal. And the courts are addressing this case and others that will determine, it will impact all of us. And we have to decide, are we going to take that crossroads in the direction of innovation and freedom? Or are we going to go towards government intrusion and expansion? That's really the choice we have right now. And um, so all, all of you, I'm sure, know that and are doing what you can. It's, it's really a crucial time in history. We probably have time for just one more question. I wonder if it was really his passion to to, to get drugs out as 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 the free the, the freedom to have that product. And I wonder how it would be different if it was a different product service commodity that he had actually brought to market and if they would have really gone after him in the way they did. Um, well Ross um, believed in free markets, he got involved in the wrong call campaign and became very um, committed to the idea of freedom and free markets. Um, he was never into drugs. He is a full scholarship student. He, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anyone never did anything, but he wasn't someone that was considered into drugs and cared about drugs. That wasn't his interest. He was very excited about Bitcoin. In fact, I said to him, should I get some? And he goes, no, mom, it's too volatile. It was worth about um, 15 cents then. Uh, <laughs> Bad advice. Um, but um, that was his passion. He was working on a Bitcoin exchange. And um, so I don't think it was about drugs at all. And, um, but as a libertarian, he believes in free choice. There were things that were restricted on the site, which on these new sites that are out, I, I understand they're not. There were anything that the Silk Road admin felt was, administration felt was harmful, such as there was no child pornography. There were no assassinations, despite what you might read in the media, by the way. Um, there were, was no stolen property. But many libertarians believe that drugs are a choice, and um, they were allowed. But it wasn't about drugs. Do you think they would have gone after a service or commodity? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what basis they would have, except that there's now, they even said in their papers that anyone who uses TOR has criminal intent. They said that, it's in writing. <laughs> and um, so, the government used I, it I didn't like that. <laughs> I, Plus Bitcoin, I don't think there was a lot of taxes being paid. So gross. <laughs> I, I have a quick follow-up to that. Uh, uh, I actually tweeted that. Um, so, Hillary didn't want, and Ross didn't either, on that. Um, so my quick follow-up to that would be that uh, the Silk Road actually allowed for Bitcoin to have its first real test case. So people are very distracted by, oh, they didn't like the drugs. In my opinion, as a person who's been in the Bitcoin space for a while, I think that it was more a concern about Silk Road giving Bitcoin an actual platform to be used to raise the value. And I believe Chuck Schumer was the head of the banking committee. So to me, it seems a little bit funny that he's so concerned about drugs because, you know, Bitcoin is a threat to central bankers everywhere, and he was already uh, working with them. So I think that that's also a question to ask yourselves for the motivations. And of course, uh, the whole, if you really made all the creators of conduits uh, liable for their whatever happens to be pass over the conduit, you couldn't have had an internet or a, or a phone system. I mean, the, the most criminal activity is conducted not uh, by uh, Bitcoin or with uh, anything to do with uh, Tor or a deep internet. It's connected, conducted with cash and over your smartphones and and all using the usual technologies. And uh, the owners of those technologies are not liable for uh, the use of the technologies. Don't they do you have anything else to add to that as well? Well, uh, I'm a huge supporter of technology in general. Uh, and I think Ray Kurzweil is right about the coming of the singularity. 
So, yeah. the printing press was great for human beings, gunpowder was great for human beings, the common man, and all of the things that are moving in Moore's law towards the singularity. So, worst case, Ross is going to be out of jail in 20 years when the world changes un unrecognizably when Kurzweil is right. So there's this cause, current cause for optimism, I think. <laughs> Technology is going to overthrow the evil state of affairs, just like all these past developments to help the common man. All right, so we'll probably have to wrap it up there. Um, Lynn, did you have any last? No, 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 I need, I need to talk about oh, this sorry. Um, I just wanted to, because it's time for the closing panel, so we're done. Okay. But thank you all for coming. Thank you for the thank film. You. Thank you for this. Nation is on Friday this week at the Main Street Stage, 10 o'clock. All right, have yourselves a good night. Give it up for my kick-ass band. Thank you so much. Have a great night.